Hello, hello. My name is uh, Jones, and uh, today we are going to look at um, other drug uh, administration routes. So, on the other drug administration routes, in the first lesson that we looked at, includes the enteral routes or the enteral route. So, in the enteral route, we talk about oral and uh, sublingual. Okay, so now um, from the enteral route where we had um, the oral and sublingual, now we are going to look at another type of route of drug administration, which is parenteral. Okay, so when we talk of parenteral, we have established that it is given by intravenous, that is through the vein, intramuscular, or subcutaneous. So in this lesson, we are going to learn of other examples that include the parenteral drug administration. To begin this lesson, let us, let us understand what is meant by parenteral drug administration. So parenteral drug administration is used for drugs that are poorly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, okay, like heparin, and for agents that are unstable within the gastrointestinal tract, or GIT, like insulin. Parenteral administration is also used for treatment of unconscious patients and the and, uh, situation that require a rapid onset of action or emergency. Okay, so when you're talking of parenteral drug administration, we are looking at drugs that can be administered because if given within the GIT or the gastrointestinal system, the example given here is heparin. These drugs will be poorly absorbed and they will not be available where they are needed within the blood or where they are needed within the receptors or within the molecules that I need to use them. Okay, so the example is heparin. Okay, so in other unstable drugs that cannot be given or that may not be given uh, through the oral route, okay, is uh, insulin or insulin. If uh, given through the GIT, they can be affected. So most of them, they are given through the subcut or subcutaneous under the skin, cutaneous to do with the skin, sub under, so under the skin. So parenteral administration is also used for treatment of uh, patients that need rapid, um, rat rapid effect or onset of action in emergencies. Now, with that discussed as a background to parenteral drug administration, let us now appreciate some of the examples of drug administration in parenteral. So the first example is intravenous, in the vein, intra, in the vein, intravenous. So these are drugs that are, will be administered directly into the vein. Intra, in the muscle, muscular. So these are drugs that are given in the muscles. Okay, it's also important that you appreciate the abbreviations because these are standard abbreviations that are used in pharmacology. When say intravenous, we abbreviate it as IV. And then when say intramuscular in the muscle, we abbreviate it as IM. Then intradermo, under the skin. Intradermo. So now under the skin, that is the intradermo subcutaneous under the skin, intraperitoneal from the peritoneum. So intraperitoneal drugs can be given, intraarterial that is directly into the artery, intracardiac drugs can also be given, especially in many situations, directly into the cardiac muscle. So intracardiac. Then intrathecal in the spine, drugs can be given directly in the spine. Then intraarticular or intra within the joint, intraarticular or drug being given in the joint, so IJ as abbreviation. Then intra bone marrow, 
drugs can also be given directly in the bone marrow. So the three major parental routes of drug are intravenous, intramuscular, and the subcutaneous. What are the advantages, what are the disadvantages of using any of these routes in drug administration? So what are the advantages of parental drug administration? Under this, I'm going to discuss three advantages. Under disadvantages, I'll also discuss three. So let's start with advantages. When you give drugs parentally, what will be the added advantage? Drugs get to the site of action more rapidly, providing a rapid response, which may be required in an emergency. So when you give in the vein, when you give in the muscle, or any other parental route, drug will easily be available. Then those can be more acutely delivered because we do not have the hepatic, the hepatic uh, phase, a metabolic phase. We are saying the drug can be easily available in the blood for the receptors that need to use them. Okay, so when you're talking of bioavailability of the drug, we're saying it can easily be available because it's not having the hepatic metabolizing part. Then, suitable for drugs that are not absorbed from GIT or the gastrointestinal tract. So we are saying when uh, you give the drug uh, parenterally, it will be suitable because uh, this drug, if it was given in the DIT, it can easily be destroyed by hepatic metabolism. Okay, so the liver metabolizes the drug, so that is a variable in the blood. So we are saying if the drug cannot tolerate this, then it is better it is given within the vein, so that it is available in the blood and used. Now, what would be the disadvantages of giving drugs uh, parenterally? The disadvantages include is that more rapid absorption can lead to increased adverse effect. When you give the drug in the vein, in the muscle, it will rapidly or in a very fast manner, it will be absorbed. So this may lead to adverse drug reaction. So more rapid absorption may increase adverse reaction. The other disadvantage is that local irritation may occur at the site of injection. As you administer the drug, it also causes irritation to the blood vessel. It causes irritation to the skin, okay? area where the drug is being administered, it is going to cause a local irritation. So local irritation may occur at the site of the injection. Then these routes are irreversible and may cause pain, fear, and infection. It is not easy or it is very difficult to reverse a reaction or adverse reaction when you're giving the drug intravenously because it is readily available within the blood. So it becomes, uh, it becomes very difficult to reverse the effects of the drug, okay, within like a short time of period in order to save the life of the patient. Okay, so those are some of the disadvantages of uh, giving the drugs uh, parenterally. Now, in talking about other routes of parental administration, or so other routes of drug administration, we said there's inhalation, where someone just breathes in the drug, like in a, uh, in a smart attack, uh, bentolin, someone just breathes in in order to have the effect. Drugs can be given also intranasal, that is intranasal from in the nose, topical, that is applied on the mucous membrane of the skin, or just applied on the skin, or other routes of drug administration is lecto. So on these other routes of drug administration, it is not parental, no. 
When you're talking about other routes, we are saying other routes other than parenteral, other routes other than enteral. We have inhydration, intranasal, tropical, and rectal. So these, they do not fall under parenteral, they do not fall under enteral. Okay, so these are just other routes of drug administration. Okay, so now um, let us look, let us now look at drug absorption in the pharmacokinetics. So when we discussed about the branches of, um, of pharmacology, we talked about pharmacokinetic. Okay, so now in pharmacokinetic, we had absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So now let us appreciate when we talk about drug absorption, what necessarily happens during drug absorption. So absorption, we are necessarily looking at the transfer of the drug from each site of administration to the bloodstream. The rates and the efficiency of absorption depend on the route of administration. For IV or intravenous delivery, absorption is complete that is, the total dose is the total dose of drug reaches the system or uh, the systemic circulation. Okay, that is the in the intravenous. So now, when talking of drug absorption, we have transport of drug from GIT tracts. Okay, so when looking at drug transport from the GIT tract, this depends on their chemical property. Drug may be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract by either passive diffusion or active transport okay so let us add more information what we mean when say drug being absorbed by either passive diffusion or active transport so let's start with the now passive diffusion this refers to passage of the drug molecules by diffusing an ionized okay moiety through lipid membrane so an ionized okay so this molecule through lipid membrane the drug moves from a region of higher concentration to one of lower concentration the vast majority of drug gains access to the body by this mechanism so most drugs are absorbed by passive diffusion passive diffusion necessarily we are looking at the drug moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration okay then we are also saying most drugs okay or a vast majority of drug gains access to the body by this process of passive diffusion let us now look at active transport when you're looking at active transport, here it requires energy. So active transport is energy dependent and is driven by the hydrolysis of adenosine triphosphate, abbreviated as ATP. Active transport, the blueprint is that it requires energy and it is dependent and it is driven by hydrolysis of ATP. It requires ATP, okay? Hydrolysis of ATP. That is what it requires when you're talking of active transport. So it is capable of moving drug against a concentration gradient that is from a region of low drug concentration to one of higher drug concentration. By using this energy, ATP, Drugs, even from a lower concentration, will be moved to the area where there is higher concentration. Okay? So, that is active transport. It requires energy because we are moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So, you require energy in active uh, transport. Okay, so now let us also look at endocytosis and exo exocytosis and a drug absorption so this is a type of drug delivery transport or transport of drugs of exceptionally large size across the cell membrane endo inside 
cyto to do with the cell. Exo outside, cyto to do with the cell. So this type of drug delivery transport drugs of exceptionally large size across the cell membrane. Endocytosis involves engulfing of a drug molecule by the cell membrane and transport it into the cell by pinching off the drug field vesicle. So the cell invaginates takes the drug and then the drug is taken up by the cell. The cell opens up, okay, so that it can engulf uh, the drug, puts it in a vacuum and then starts using the drug. So this type of drug delivery transport drugs of exceptionally large size across the cell membrane. When you talk of endocytosis, it involves engulfing or engulfment of a drug molecule by the cell membrane and transport into the cell by pinching off the drug field vesicle. Now, when you talk of exocytosis, this is the reverse of endocytosis, and it is used by cells to secrete many substances by a similar vesicle formation process. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. This one is used by cells to secrete many substances by similar vesicle formation process so that the drug can be used. Okay, so now, here on drug absorption, drugs are mostly are absorbed by passive diffusion. If a drug has to move from a higher concentration to lower, it has to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, then it will be transported by active transport. If the molecule is big, then it will be taken up by the cell using endocytosis through engulfment of the molecule so that it is used, or exocytosis, where the cell releases certain substances so that the drug can be used. Okay, now in talking about uh, pharmacokinetics, we also talked about distribution, A D M E, absorption, distribution. So, drug distribution is the next aspect that we are now looking at. So, drug distribution is the process by which a drug reversibly leaves the blood stream and enters interstitium that is the extracellular fluid and or the cell of the tissue drug distribution we are looking at the process by which a drug reversibly leaves the bloodstream and it enters the interstitium or the extracellular fluid and or the cell tissue the drug is being distributed drug distribution okay so it is entering the interstitial inter that is extracellular fluid and all the cell of the tissue okay so now under drug distribution what can we say about blood flow so the rate of blood flow to the tissue capillaries varies widely as a result of an equal distribution of a cardiac output to the various organs blood flows to the brain liver and kidney and is greater than to the skeletal muscle apple's tissue has a as a still lower rate of blood flow so more drugs are delivered to greater blood flow areas okay so here we are saying the rate of blood flow of that is tissue capillary, it will vary according to the amount of blood that is supplying the tissue, that is the tissue gets supplied with. So as a result of an equal distribution of cardiac output to various organs, you are saying blood flows to the brain, liver, kidney, and this is greater than to the skeletal muscle, to the adipose tissue. So where there is more blood flow, you are expecting more of the drug to go there, okay, or to be distributed there because there's more blood 
the blood which is carrying the drug. So the more of the drug will go there. So let us now talk about also capillary permeability in drug distribution. So when talking about capillary, capillary, these are smallest uh, blood vessels, okay? Permeability, them to allow other substances to, to, to pass through. So we are talking about capillary permeability. It varies widely in various tissues. In brain, capillary endothelial cells are continuous and have no slit junction. So that only lipid soluble or an ionized drug can it cross? So it's not all drugs that crosses the blood-brain barrier, okay? Some drugs can. So now we are saying, th so only those that are lipid soluble and or ion an ionized drug can cross the blood-brain barrier. So the brain capillary and the serial cells are continuous and they do not have a slit of slit junction, okay? So not all drugs will go and reach the brain, okay? So there's what we call the blood-brain barrier, okay? So then, in the liver and spleen, a large part of basement membrane is exposed by large discontinuous capillary through which large plasma proteins can pass. Hence, most of the drugs can be passed through to pass through the liver, okay? as compared to the, most of the drugs passing through the brain. Of course, we don't want almost all drugs to pass through the brain because they may easily affect it as a, it is a delicate organ. So when we talk of capillary permeability, here we are appreciating that it varies according to the tissue or organ. Certain drugs can be made available direct to the brain because there are certain conditions that are affecting the brain directly. So you may require the drug to go inside the brain there to help reduce the infection or to help reduce the condition. But when we talk of the liver and the spleen, we have a large part of basement membrane that is exposed by large discontinuous capillary through which large plasma proteins can pass. Okay, so with that appreciated, let us now look at the binding of the drug to plasma proteins. Okay, so in the capillary permeability, we have said in the liver and spleen, a large part of the basement membrane is exposed by large discontinuous capillary through which large plasma proteins can pass. So it is important that at this point we understand the binding of drug to plasma proteins. So drug molecules may bind to plasma protein, usually albumin, okay? It's a protein that transports a lot of drugs. So this is albumin. So drug molecules may bind to plasma protein, usually albumin, and bound drugs are pharmacologically inactive. Okay, so only the free ones. And bound drugs can act on target sites in the tissues. So the part of the drug that has now is not bound to albumin can now act on the site of the on the tissue. So bound drug stays in the vascular space and is not metabolized or eliminated. When the drug is still bound to albumin, it will not be metabolized or eliminated. Okay, so now when it is made available within the blood, it will be used by the tissues. Okay, so drug molecules may bind to plasma proteins. So usually here, when you're talking about plasma proteins that drugs may bound to, it's albumin. And these drugs, when they have been bound, they pharmacologically are inactive. But only the free molecules, okay, from albumin, okay, which is bounding it, so are going to act on the target tissue. So drugs have like half-life. So there will be amount of drug that will be allowed to cause effect on the tissue, not that they will be used at the same time. All right, so now let us look at apparent volume of distribution, okay, in appreciating how the drug is made biologically available to the tissue where it is supposed to work. So apparent volume of distribution will help us to appreciate this. 
So a drug rarely associates exclusively with only one of the water compartments of the body. Instead, the vast majority of drugs distribute into several compartments, often avidly binding cellular compartments. For example, lipids, abundant in adipose sites and cell membranes. So protein, these are abundant in plasma and within cells. Or nucleic acid, which is abundant in nuclei of who? the cell. Therefore, the volume into which drugs distribute is called the apartment volume of distribution. Okay, so I have the formula here. Volume of distribution, okay, abbreviated as VD, it will be equal to dose administered. So you may administer 500 milligram of a drug. It's not the whole 500 milligram that will be made available in the blood. So you can look at plasma concentration of the drug that has been bound to albumin. And then, the, when you divide, okay, volume of distribution, you are going to find the drug that is now remaining to be active on the tissue, okay? So you have to divide. So let's say the dose administered is, let's say, 500. Then the plasma concentration you find is 250. So 250 into 500, that is 2. So the volume of distribution then now becomes 2. Okay, so I'll, for this one, I have a board series of lessons where I just teach how to calculate and give you a lot of examples on a volume of distribution calculation for the drugs. Now, let us look at drug metabolism. Under pharmacokinetics, there is absorption, there is distribution, and there is a, a metabolism of the drug, then excretion. So now we are now looking at drug metabolism. So drugs are most eliminated by biotransformation, biobiology, so transforming, transformation. Drugs are most eliminated by bowel transformation and or excretion into the urine or bowel. The process of metabolism transforms lipophilic drugs into more polar, readily excretable products. The liver is the major site for drug metabolism, but specific drug may undergo bowel transformation in other tissues such as the kidney and the intestine. Okay, so what is the reaction of what is the reaction of drug metabolism? We are the study said that most drugs are eliminated by bowel transformation by the changing biological transformation that is happening to it. Okay, so this transformation may come because of the effect of the liver, effect of the kidney on the drug or the effect of the intestine on the drug. So when they are transformed, then these drugs can be excreted and then the other components can be used. So what are the reactions of drug metabolism? So the kidney cannot efficiently eliminate lipophilic drugs that readily cross cell membrane and are reabsorbed in the distal tubules. Therefore, lipid soluble agent must first be metabolized in the liver using two general sets of reaction. These are called phase one and phase two. So in the reaction of drug metabolism, the kidney cannot efficiently eliminate those that are, when you say lipophilic or lipophilic from lipids, so lipophilic drugs, Okay, so those drugs that have affinity for fats or fat more related drugs, those cannot be efficiently eliminated by the kidney. So they, so we are saying these lipophilic drugs that readily cross cell membrane are reabsorbed in the distal uh, tubules. Therefore, lipid soluble agent must first be metabolized in the liver using two general sets of reaction. Okay, so these general reactions we are calling we are calling them phase one and phase two. Okay, so now 
what happens in phase one? Reaction function to convert lipophilic molecules into more polar molecules by exposing of polar functional group. Mainly it is a, it is oxidation, okay, as a process that happens. So it's through the process of oxidation in reaction function, we are having the drug that is lipophilic molecule that is being converted into polar molecule. So, but sometimes there is reduction or there can be hydrolysis. So lipophilic drugs or molecules can be reduced the polar molecule by exposing the polar function, okay? So the polar molecule by the exposing the polar function group. So now, which process are involved in phase one? So in phase one, in reducing these drugs, the process of oxidation can happen to reduce this drug. Or the process of reduction, or the process of adding a water molecule, or hydrolysis. Then phase two, this phase consists of conjugation reaction. If the metabolite from phase one metabolism is sufficiently polar, it can be excreted by the kidneys. However, many phase one metabolites are too lipophilic to be retained in the kidney tubules. So a subsequent conjugation reaction with an endogenous substrate, such as sulfuric acid, acetic acid, or amino acid, results in polar and more water soluble compound that in excrete that can be excreted by the kidney so this is what happens in phase two in phase one there is process of oxidation reduction or hydrolysis in phase one this is happening to lipophilic molecules so that the polar group or the polar molecule is exposed okay so that the polar molecule becomes exposed a polar functional group becomes exposed okay so that it can easily be moved by the kidney so in phase two this involves conjugation as a reaction okay so if the metabolite from phase one molecule is sufficiently polar it can be excreted by the kidney but we are saying if the many let's say if the phase one metabolites are too lipophilic they're still too fatty okay lipophilic to be retained within the kidney tubules there should be a subsequent conjugation reaction so in phase two we are having a conjugation reaction okay that is exposing more of the polar group a subsequent conjugation reaction with an endogenous substrate such as so sulfuric acid acetic acid or amino acid that results in polar and more water soluble compounds that can be excreted by the kidney. Phase two, there is conjugation. So there's conjugation and the endogenous substrate that have been used is sulfuric acid, acetic acid, or amino acids, so that it exposes the polar group so that it becomes more water soluble, okay, for the kidney to excrete. Okay, so now with that, let us now look at the last component of drug of, of pharmacokinetics. So in pharmacokinetics, we have absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So the last component of pharmacokinetics is elimination. So let us look at drug elimination. So this is the removal of a drug from the body that occur via a number of routes, the most important being through the kidney, that is through the urine. Other routes include the bowel, intestine, lung, or milk in mothers who are nursing. So a patient in renal failure may undergo extra corporeal diuresis which removes small molecules such as the drugs. So routes of elimination include the kidney, the liver, GIT, 
and the lungs. When you're talking of routes of drug administration, the kidney is one of those organs. The liver, it is one. The GIT, the lungs, and then we have other routes. So now, what we mean when say the route of elimination, we say kidney. This is the excretion of the drug and their metabolites into urine. Okay? So this drug is being excreted. It is coming out through urine. Okay? Into urine and involves that. So glomerular filtration, e.g. of water soluble and polar compound that are less than 500 Dalton, these are removed. There is active tubular secretion. There can be passive tubular reabsorption. So that the, the other components that are needed, they are used by the body. Tubular secretions, the other component that the body does not need to use, they are excreted. So routes of elimination, the kidney, the part of the drug. So that's why when someone takes, for instance, uh, some penicillin like amoxy, you also feel the stint of smell in the urine of the amoxy. So it's a drug being excreted. Okay, so then the other route for elimination of the drug is the liver. It can secrete drugs or their metabolites into bile that are lost in pieces. However, some drug may be reabsorbed in intestine to again enter the circulation. Okay, so the liver eliminates part of the drug through the bile that is released and then to come out in pieces. So it is normal that even pieces may also have a stint of smell of a drug that someone had taken. Why is that? Because the drug is being eliminated. So through the process of uh, conjugation, okay, we are having the liver also being involved in the elimination of the drug as the bowel is being formed. Then through the gastrointestinal tract, some drugs are treated through the GIT. Like if we talk about we talk about thiocyanides, iodides, and uh, mercury in uh, let's say mercury in saliva, we talk of morphine through passive diffusion in the stomach, so they can be released within the GIT. Okay, so when we talk of GIT, we're talking of gastrointestinal tracts. Okay, so which everything that goes through the mouth at the end it comes out uh, through the anus. So. The other routes of drug elimination are the lungs. Gaseous and volatile general anesthetic is excreted in expired air. Okay, so as we are breathing out for volatile general anesthetic, they, they can be released, okay, they can be eliminated, okay, through the air that we are expiring. Okay, so now, Apart from the kidney, liver, and the GIT, okay, and the lungs, it is important that we should also know that drugs are also ad, uh, they are also eliminated through other routes like sweat. Okay, if someone who has taken certain drugs, the smell within the sweat can still be felt. That is it, the elimination of the drug. Drugs are also eliminated in tears breast milk so when the mother is taking piriton okay that piriton can be eliminated in the breast so the baby also gets affected by the piriton that the mother has taken because it is being passed out through the breast so breast milk salivary secretion okay so through saliva drugs can also be eliminated so breast milk please you have to be careful let's say you're taking tetracycline as a mother your breastfeeding mother, it can be eliminated into the breast milk and affect the baby's detention in future. Okay, so today we are looking at another component in pharmacology, in lessons of pharmacology, and that is to do with the drug administration through the parental route. Okay, parental route that is intravenous, intramuscular, intradermal subcutaneous we have mentioned many parts okay then the three major parental routes of drug administration are mostly intravenous intramuscular and subcutaneous we have discussed the advantages of parental drug administration of which they are the best 
in emergency. The disadvantage is adverse reactions that can be seen, okay, may be difficult to reverse. Then other routes of drug administration, which can be through inhalation, intranasal, topical, lector. Then we have expanded our branches of pharmacology, which is a pharmacokinetic by looking at absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. In a drug absorption, we have talked about how drugs are absorbed mostly by passive diffusion from low to high concentration, drugs being absorbed, then from high to low concentration through active transport, then endocytosis, the drugs being eaten up by a cell, invagination of a cell to eat the drug or exocytosis. Then drug distribution. Not all drugs like we reach all organs, others they have got barriers. And the special organ there is the brain, which has got what we call blood brain barrier. The more of the blood flow to an area, the more you expect the drug to be distributed. When you're talking of drug distribution. Okay, so then the binding of the drug to plasma proteins. This has to do with mostly albumin. That is where drugs are, the drugs, that is the protein that will carry mostly the drugs. So when the, the drug has been carried by albumin, it is inactive. Until it is released in the tissue where it is required, then it, the free radicals will be used. Then apparent volume of distribution can be determined by volume of distribution equal to the dose administered divided by plasma concentration of the drug. So when you have administered the drug, we also want to look at the concentration of the drug in the plasma as it is being used. So drug distribution also may involve reaction of drug uh, metabolism, which has two phases, phase one and phase two. Phase one is mostly about oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. Phase two is about the remaining lipophilic uh, molecules that become conjugated so that they can be excreted by the kidney. Then we have looked at the drug elimination, okay, which is another step in the pharmacokinetics. It's the drug being coming out. So in drug elimination, drug are eliminated by the kidney, the liver, the GIT, and the lungs. And then on other routes, we are looking of drug administration, we are looking at sweat, tears, breast milk, and the salivary secretion. So that is a lesson for today that we are looking at. Uh, the next lesson, it will be on pharmacodynamics. We have looked at pharmacokinetics and parenteral drug administration. So we now look at pharmaco pharmacodynamic, uh, pharmacodynamic in our next lesson. So for now, please, uh, we encourage you to keep uh, studying, uh, keep studying as we try to cover most of these lessons in pharmacology.